So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you two um, sort of lectures to really just introduce the subject of, of um, genomics and genome-wide approaches. Um, and then this afternoon we have a bioinformatics practical where we'll go over to the computer lab and I've got some exercises for you to do. Um, hopefully that everything, I was panicking this morning trying to get the files uploaded and stuff, but it seems like we're going to be good. So we get to play with uh, some of the TriTripDB database. If you haven't played with that, I know probably most of you have, so it should be simple. Um, one of the things that the, the last two exercises are using RNA-seq data, real RNA-seq data that we generated um, using the Artemis browser tool, and I'm suspecting that most of you have probably not used that. Um, I've, I've got some data and I've put it into a spreadsheet that I'm going to ask you to look at as well. Hopefully that will work because we're just getting open office set up. It'll give you a, a feel for how to interpret the data. You won't, unfortunately, have sort of a real heavy-duty hands-on experience in programming that type of the thing that you really need to have when you're doing bioinformatics. But that's probably okay, because that would be a whole week's course in itself. There's probably a few of you here who, who do that type of stuff uh, and, and sort of know what I'm talking about. But at least it'll give you a flavor for doing the analysis of the data that you get back from the bioinformatics people. And that's actually a problem uh, because you know, the bioinformatics people give you back data and they don't know the biological experiment a lot of the time, so you, it's up for you to interpret what the data is. But you need to understand what the data is and isn't. So hopefully we'll, we'll get a bit of a feel for that this afternoon. But anyway, let's get started now. So um, as I said, I'm going to give you um, a couple of presentations. Whoops. Sorry, I've now forgotten how to use my pointer. So the first one will be on, on really uh, sequencing uh, genomes, uh, and then the second one will be on RNA-seq. In the RNA-seq one, I'll actually go into some detail of, of the, how uh, the most popular platform, Illumina, works. In, in the first one, I'll talk to you about PacBio, which is a, a different platform. And then in the practical uh, this afternoon, we'll talk about TriTripDB and uh, some RNA-seq analysis, as I said. So. When I say uh, genome-wide analysis or omics, what does that really encompass? Well, obviously, it starts off with sequencing the genome, uh, and really there's two things there that you, you need. Is the gene content and how it changes between your reference and uh, you know, the particular genome that you're working with, and be that the parasite or the host. Uh, and then there's epigenetics, which is all of the regulation, all of the markers for regulating gene expression. And I'm not really going to talk very much about epigenetics um, today because we, we really don't have time. Um, but if those of you who are interested, you, we can talk about how you might do that and how you might use the data. Um, okay, so that's, that's basically sort of, as the people say, like to say, that's a parts list, or what are all of the genes, what might you be able to express if you... Uh, what's the uh, organism capable of expressing? Um, and then you can use, you can look at the messenger RNA abundance at different life cycle stages, under different conditions, etc. So now you're looking at really what is actually being expressed at any given time under any given condition. Um, at the RNA level, as we'll see later on today, that's actually, you shouldn't uh, take that as being what, is, what proteins are actually being made. Uh, but at least it gives you a good start, and this truly is now with RNA-seq genome-wide. You can really look at every single gene, is it expressed or is it not expressed, and you'll see the nuances of that that, uh, that are important as well. Uh, as I said, uh, and perhaps I should go down here next, we can use mass spectrometry to look at protein abundance and phosphorylation and other changes. So you can actually look at to see what proteins are being made at any given time in um, your, both your host or your, or your parasite. Uh, and so that's really sort of what's important. Um, the problem with mass spectrometry, and I'm not going to spend very much time talking about it, uh, is that it's not completely comprehensive. Probably if you really, really try hard, you can you can sample about 50% of the proteins in the cell. So 
The other 50%, you don't really know what's going on. So you, you're relying on, on the RNA-seq or the uh, microarrays, if you're old-fashioned, um, to, to tell you what's going on there. But the problem is that, as we'll see, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between here. You can have very abundant messenger RNA, but no protein. The way around that at the genome scale is, is sort of now maybe five, the last five or so years, is ribosome profiling, where you look at what uh, RNAs are actually being translated at any given stage. Uh, and so you get truly a comprehensive view of what's being translated. What that doesn't tell you, of course, is the turnover of the protein. So it's not as good as mass spec, but it's at least a pretty good surrogate. And we'll see that we like to... Uh, I, I like to do that, and you're, I'll hopefully convince you why it's important. Uh, it does tend to be a bit more expensive and more difficult, though, so it's probably not <coughs> something you do on a routine basis. Okay, so let's go back in history. Back when I was your age, well, maybe a little older, this is how we did sequence it, right? When, and this is in, we're talking the mid-90s now, so, I don't know, hopefully everyone was born by then, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> When we first thought about sequencing genomes, it was, you know, when I, when I was a, a, a postdoc, we would sequence a gene, and that would, you know, take you up several months to sequence a gene. In the, in the mid-90s, we started talking about sequencing entire genomes. And for a parasite the size of Leishmania, 30 megabase uh, genome, that meant a, quite a bit of work. We had to cut the genome up into uh, clones, and usually we would try large insert clones like Cosmids or Bax and Pax and Yaks, and all of these things that we don't remember anymore. Um, and then we, before we even start sequencing, we'd restriction map them so that we would fingerprint them, and then we'd use that information to align them to one another. So you'd get the whole genome covered in several thousand clones that we all had aligned before you even started sequencing. Um, and so you end up with a, um, a minimum tile path of clones, and then you would shotgun sequence a, a cosmid or a bat. And now a cosmid is about 40 kilobases of DNA, and that at the time was the limit of what you could do. You couldn't actually assemble anything more than 40 kilobases. It was too difficult computationally to do. So you did that, and you'd go walk your way through the genome one chromosome, one cosmid at a time, and then you'd stitch them together into a chromosome. Um, as we started, and we started sequencing the Leishmania genome like this, I think in, in 1996, 1995, 1996, we started sequencing L major. Uh, as we were going, the technology evolved, so basically we decided, you know, after we'd done this, well, this is really too slow. So let's do this map-as-you-go approach, and here you just take the clones, and instead of fingerprinting them, you just sequence the end of the clones. Uh, and rem I will remind you that this was old-fashioned Sanger sequencing, where you got, you know, five or six hundred, maybe eight hundred base pairs of sequence out of each end of your clone. You would then sequence them, and then you just basically shotgun. So you'd, you'd choose a couple of these sequences that you had the ends of. You'd then sequence everything. You'd choose a couple of them, and you'd shotgun sequence the clone, and then you would now have one cosmet that you knew the entire sequence of, and you would align all of the other end sequences to it, and you'd find out which cosmets overlapped with that and had the least overlap. And then you'd go sequence that, and you'd repeat. Uh, and so that we call map as you go. Uh, the advantage of that was that it skipped all of this restriction mapping, and you started actually um, isolating genes uh, or, or identifying genes as you were going. The, one of the advantages was, it's, was scalable, so that you could actually do that in one lab and someone else could be doing another cosmet. And in fact, the first time I came to Trieste here was when the um, ULICE project was underway. The European Commission had funded several labs in Europe, including ICGEB, to sequence uh, clones from the Leishmania Major Cosmet Library. So we came here for a meeting in 2001, actually, where we were sort of comparing our data. By that stage, though, the field had moved on, and we were doing whole chromosome shotgun sequencing. So you'd isolate chromosome DNA, um, and if you were working in a bacteria, that chromosome would be the whole genome. Uh, and you would just put it, cut it up into small uh, insert clones, plasmids, and you would sequence the plasmids, and then you'd throw all of the data into a computer, and you'd uh, assemble them all. That was computationally intensive at that stage, and you know it would take us a day on a computer 
to assemble a 40, uh, 40 megabase, sorry, 40 kilobase uh, uh, cosmic. By the early 2000s, you could do a chromosome, you know, several hundred kilobases, and you could probably do that in a few hours on your computer. And then by the mid 2000s, you were doing whole genomes that way. Now, of course, it takes you, you know, minutes to to sequence and, uh, and assemble an entire genome the size of a parasite and maybe a couple of hours to do the, the human genome. So things have moved on a little bit, but I, I wanted to give you some historical perspective. So once you've got this sequence of, uh, let's say, a chromosome or the entire genome, well, what do you do? I mean, you've got a bunch of, of uh, long strings of A's, C's, G's, and T's that really are pretty meaningless. So what you have to do is you have to find, you have to annotate it. Uh, and so it's this uh, process of gene prediction and annotation is not a trivial uh, task. Uh, and over this slide, I'll sort of go through how, at least my thinking of how this works. Uh, you guys probably take all that for granted because you can go to the database and find out what someone has annotated. The dirty little secret of that is that it's not the gospel truth. It's, it's subject to interpretation. But the first step is you find all of the possible protein coding genes. For uh, an, an organism like Leishmania, we have a big advantage is that they only, they have virtually no introns. There are actually two genes in Leishmania that have introns. Uh, so all we have to do is find the open reading frames, um, and you have a good chance that some of those open reading frames will be encoding proteins. So you find all of the open reading frames above a certain size, but you have to remember that an open reading frame, just because it's an open reading frame, doesn't mean that it's a coding uh, sequence. CDS stands for coding sequence. And that doesn't mean that it's a gene. There are a lot of open reading frames that don't encode proteins. The bigger the open reading frame is, the more likely it is to uh, encode a protein. But I've seen some large open reading frames that are not protein coding. And we'll come to that in, in a moment. So after you've done that, you can use statistical methods to determine the likelihood of whether a particular open reading frame is going to encode a protein. And, and I have some sort of favorite ones. And this is technology that was really worked out back in the 70s and 80s, some of it. So, and it's based on the, on the composition of the DNA. Uh, and so it was found uh, at that time that that genes, gene coding regions, have a particular bias. So there's a codon usage bias, and that's different for each organism. So if you look at the uh, open reading frame and you determine what the bias of the codons are, and it's generally in the third position of the codon that's important, if that look matches the codon usage of the organism that you're uh, looking at, then it's more likely that that's a protein coding gene. Of course, that assumes that you know what the coding Bias, codon bias for that organism is. Um, and so if you're sequencing a new organism, you won't know. So it's a circular argument to some extent. Um, if you don't know what it is, you can use a program like GeneScan, which will look at the, at the bias of the nucleotides. Um, or my favorite, actually a very old-fashioned one, is this test code, which is the period three constraint. So that's really all organisms have a bias in the third position. So because of the third position being a wobble, if the third position is, sort of, is more random than the first and the second position of the, of the uh, codon. So if you look and you see that every third position along the open reading frame is, is sort of, um, has a, there's a periodicity that is three, that tells you that that's likely to be a protein coding sequence. And you get a single score. And I, you know, we, we may or may not have time to, to look at that in more detail. You get a plot. And, uh, whoops, sorry. You get a plot, and, and you know, if it's above the line, you say this is likely to be a protein coding gene, and below it's not. And now, more recently, there are hidden Markov models. Uh, of, this is sort of glimmer. We're talking, you know, mid 2000s at this stage. This was sort of state of the art at that stage. None of this has really changed all that much. People have put it together. Uh, what's really important, though, is that none of these methods is entirely reliable by themselves. You really need to combine them all. Um, and so I had a graduate student uh, at that time who wrote some software that combined all four of these uh, and presented them all together. And then they sort of got to vote 
as to whether that particular method thought that it was good. And if we got three out of four votes, then I said, okay, now it's a protein coding gene. If you got one out of four votes, we said, no, probably not. Um, and, and there are lots of software that will still do that. Again, these days, pretty much you don't have to do that because you're going to align your genome against a reference and you're going to not do what we call uh, gene prediction or de novo gene prediction. You're just going to look to see what you'll do a blast search and see whether your gene looks like someone else's gene and then it's likely to be a, um, a protein coding sequence, provided that the reference is correct. So always remember that the reference is always not going to be completely correct. These days, they're generally better than they were initially. Okay, so the problem that you have now is, okay, you've identified what's likely to be a protein coding gene, but you don't know what the Dickens it does. So how do you find out what your gene does? Well, the first thing to do, whoops, sorry, keep hitting the wrong buttons here, is you take your sequence, and it's better to take the protein sequence, and you do a blast search uh, against the, um, a database of all of the, generally it's better if it's all of the known genomes, uh, all of the known genes, or maybe if you're, if you're in Leishmania, you'll go to Tritripti B, as we'll find out in a moment. You'll just do it against the trypanosomes. And, and you, it's guilt by association. If your gene looks like another gene, and that gene has ascribed a function to it, well, then it's likely that your gene is doing something at least similar. There's an art... Um, to how similar is similar enough. Uh, and the problem with that is if you get overly confident, you end up with this problem of what's called transitive annotation. So your gene looks sort of similar to some other gene that looks sort of similar to some other gene. And so that first gene, actually, someone did some biology on it, some biochemistry on it, and they knew it was, let's say, you know, a, an oxidoreductase. They might not even know what it was re reducing. But the second one looks sort of like that, so the second person said, oh, but it must be the same oxidoreductase, and your gene looks sort of like that as well. But it actually doesn't even look like the first one at all. So how confident are you going to be that that's really its function? Probably you shouldn't be very confident. Nowadays, there are a lot of other methods that we can use as well to sort of back that up a little bit. So this is the first, the first step, is, is to do a blast search. Um, the problem with that is that in an organism like Leishmania, particularly when we first sequence Leishmania, something over 60% of all of the protein coding genes that we had matched nothing else except other hypothetical trypanosomative proteins or hypothetical genes from somewhere else. So, so it was pretty much useless in terms of knowing what the function is. Uh, there are uh, several methods that you can use to using for patterns, you can use ProSite or Prince or ProDomins, and there's some newer ones that are not even on here, or Profiles, and these are just really different methods, uh, different algorithms that you can use at different sites that will give you things that you wouldn't find, and the, the similarity is not similar enough to do a blast analysis on them to give you a sensible result, but they, they look for small, uh, uh, conservation of small patterns that would give you some hint as to what they're uh, uh, um, function of that protein is. My current favorite is one called HHPRED, which I actually forgot to put up here. Uh, and what HHPRED does is it takes your sequence and it tries to thread its predicted structure against everything that, uh, against the proteins that are in the structure database, in, in the protein database. And it looks to see whether the the predicted structure is the, is the same as a known structure. Because structural conservation is really important, and, but you can get structural conservation without having any sequence, without getting really any significant sequence conservation. And so I found that to be particularly useful. It does, of course, presuppose that your prediction of the structure from the sequence is accurate. Ten years ago, I would have said that was not going to be very likely. Now it's actually pretty good. You can pretty much now just take the primary amino acid sequence and have a fairly good idea of what the structure of the uh, protein that is going to be. So that's fairly reliable. It's not entirely reliable, but it's pretty reliable. So, so I actually use um, HHPRED a lot, and HHPRED will find things that these will tend to miss. 
And so I'll go in and I'll find something, I'll, it'll give me a, a match in HH Pred, and then I'll go back and find, okay, the protein that it's matching has a, a prosite domain that gives me a hint to its function. And then it's a hypothesis that you would then really have to test. Um, all of this, when we, were, when we first started on this, uh, and it was, you know, it was really sort of the Wild West, the, it was up to the annotator what he, he or she called the uh, protein, what the name of the protein was, and so it was really almost impossible to compare a set of proteins in one genome to another set of proteins in another genome because they had slight differences in what they called things. So in the sort of early 2000s, this gene ontology pro project started to get some traction and it was a very methodical uh, way of annotating the function um, and the um, uh, location of a particular protein. And so that's really now pretty much state of the art. So it enables you now to say, okay, this gene with this gene ontology and this organism is essentially the ortholog of this one in this um, genome. And so it's much easier to compare genomes now and, and know that you're really talking about the same gene. Okay, so all of this first part is all about protein coding genes. Well, what about the RNA genes? We, didn't, we need to now identify what are the RNA genes? So some of those are easy. You can do BLAST searches and you can probably find all of the uh, ribosomal RNA genes by BLAST similarity, at least if you have a closely related organism. You can use a program called TRNA, tRNA scan, which is pretty good at predicting tRNA. So those are fairly trivial. Of course, now there's a lot of other RNA genes. Um, there are SNOs and, and um, SNRNAs. Those are more difficult to predict. And being able to, oops, our ability to predict, uh, you know, small interfering RNAs if you happen to be working in an organism and have them is, is really very limited. So those are going to be uh, difficult. And those you're probably going to have to rely on RNA seq data to actually tell you where those RNAs are. And we'll come back to that in the second talk. Whoops, sorry, what was my last slide there? Oh. Just the point saying that, okay, in, in my opinion, whoop, I'm sorry, in my opinion, you can, you can do this all in, in a manual fashion, which is what I did when I was doing this back in the you know, 2000s. And I, I think that's fairly accurate because you're making intelligent decisions. As you automate it, it becomes less... Um, Less reliable, so, but of course it's a lot faster. So, you know, it took us, um, it took me and, and most other annotators, um, you know, a couple of days to annotate 100 kilobases. Um, so it would take you weeks to annotate an entire genome. So that's obviously not sustainable now when it takes minutes to generate one. So, so automated uh, annotation is really pretty much what you've got to do, but you do have to remember that the automated annotation is making a lot of assumptions and, and they may or may not be correct. Not to say that the manual annotation is always correct either, um, but at least it's got someone looking at it. And, and the man, so pretty much everything's done automated these ways, these days. Okay. Um, so in 2005, major landmark for us who are interested in Leishmania, the uh, three trypanosomated or tritrip genomes were, were uh, sort of completed. L major was pretty much completed. T. brucei was really, yeah, sort of completed something, somewhere, and T. cruzi was a bit of a mess um, for reasons that we might go into later on. Uh, but nevertheless, we published them and got them on the, on the cover of Science in that, uh, on their 125th anniversary of Science, as it turned out. So, so that was, I think, a, a major landmark. And what did we learn? Well, I mean, one of the, this is just one example of the things that we learned that enabled us to compare the three genomes and come up with a, uh, a map of, of some of the metabolism looked like this. And so you could actually, by looking at the genes that were present or absent, say, these genes here, the things that are marked in green, are present only in L major. And so without actually doing any biochemistry experiments, you could predict that what products might be present only in, in Leishmania or, or 
only in some other organism or you know present in all of the species. So this was, I think, very you know very useful uh, for people who cared about biochemistry. Um, what did it tell us about genome organization? The Leishmania genome, and, and you know, hopefully most of you already know this, um, occurs as generally 30, between 34 and 36 chromosomes, depending on the species. And the chromosome pairs, they are, it's a diploid organism, so there's a pair of chromosomes, and they're generally similar in size, although sometimes they differ due to differences in the subtelomeric repeats. And what was interesting was, in, at least in L major, there were very few heterozygous alleles. Um, and so I always keep this slide up here and said, oh, all life mania is like that. But actually, the more recent genomes, there are some Leishmania genomes where there's actually quite a bit of heterozygosity between alleles. Um, for instance, in L. Donabani, there seems to be a lot more heterozygosity. So I, I might have to revise that a little bit. Leishmania luckily doesn't have very many repeats. There are a fair number of genes that are duplicated, so that can cause a problem. Uh, and there are some genes where there are tandem amino acid repeats, which uh, can be confusing. Uh, and then, of course, most of you probably know about the interspersed intergenic repeats, uh, the so-called cider elements, that are probably uh, uh, remnants of um, retrotransposons, but they now have been uh, seconded to have a role in regulating RNA abundance, probably. All right, so uh, let's continue. So uh, Leishmania has frequent gene amplification, as probably most of you know. Uh, but overall, Leishmania has a, quite a simple genome compared to the, the particularly T. cruzi, and we'll see Crithidia uh, also have a, quite a complicated uh, uh, genome. So we're lucky working on Leishmania. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. <coughs> OK, what is the gene organization like? Well, it's unusual. Um, and that became apparent sort of actually in the fir very first cosmid that we sequenced, uh, that there was something strange going on. The first cosmid that we sequenced uh, was here on chromosome 1, and it contained this strand switch region on chromosome 1. So that, I think, was the first time that anyone had found a strand switch region. Uh, and we thought, oh, that's interesting. This, there are these. We knew that there was polycystronic transcription in these organisms and because people had sequenced you know, two or three genes together and they were on the same strand. We, we sequenced the rest of chromosome 1 and found that that was, in fact, the only strand switch region on the entire chromosome. Uh, which then sort of extended to other chromosomes. So, so there are uh, this polycystronic transcription where you've got most of the chromosomes only have one or two or perhaps five or six for some of the larger ones, polycystronic transcriptional units um, over the entire chromosome. And they can be organized, and in fact there's only 135 of them in, um, in the entire genome uh, of Leishmania. Um, and they can be either divergent so the genes are transcribed from this point here on chromosome 1 in that direction and in that direction, or on other chromosomes, they can, this is chromosome 4, they can be convergent. They start at the telomeres and they go in. And obviously on the larger chromosomes, you'll have both divergent and convergent on the, on the same um, uh, chromosome. Uh, and often, whoops, sorry... Often these are separated by RNA genes. So here's an example on chromosome 9 or something, I think, where there's a tRNA um, locus at this divergent strand switch region. Actually, it's more, more frequent that the convergent strand switch regions have um, RNA genes at their loci. So that type of organization is, as far as I know, unique to the trypanosomatids. Um, it's something that, that uh, seems to have evolved in, in trypanosomatid history. They went off in this direction that's different to everything else. Okay, so that was the, the first generation of, of uh, sequencing in the, of the trypanosomatid genomes was the, all done by Sanger sequencing for the most part. Nowadays, no one does Sanger sequencing anymore, except for maybe a, you know, if you want to verify the sequence of your plasma. The, in the probably around 2010 or something, there was a, a, a sort of revolution as next generation sequencing um, came to pass. And there are several different methods that, that uh, were used. Um, and as the dust has pretty much sorted, uh, sorted itself out now, 
it's pretty clear that this uh, sequencing by synthesis or Illumina sequencing is the winner, uh, and that works really well. For $200 uh, per sample, you can get about uh, 100 million reads of, let's say, 100 to 300 nucleotides each. So you can sequence your entire Leishmania genome for $200 uh, dollars and then assemble it all at probably 100x coverage. Um, so what took us 10 years now can be done in sort of an afternoon, basically. Uh, you will see, a mo see in a moment that it's not entirely accurate. There are some problems. Um, the, the other advantage is you don't have to do any cloning. Uh, and so it's great for doing draft genomes and comparing them to a reference. Uh, and you'll see it's good for RNA-seq and for the various flavors of uh, epigenetic uh, sequencing that are, are now available. Uh, and so how does this work? And I'll sort of briefly go into this for those of you who are uh, familiar with it. You take your genomic DNA and you, um, you shear it and you put on your linkers and then you amplify the linkers with the sequencing primers and then you stick them on, the, on your chip. Uh, and you sequence them in both directions, and now they're mostly multiplex, so you actually do three sequencing runs. The third one, uh, which actually runs second, is the, um, the uh, indexing run. So, so you can get you know, hundreds, I mean, this is actually a bit low now. The current machines are probably up at 800 million reads per, per uh, chip, and so you can get 100 of X coverage. If you multiplex them, uh, again, this is a bit low. Most people are now multiplexing in the tens to, to hundreds of, of range. And you want to aim for genomic sequencing to be in about 50 to 100x coverage of your genome. So depending on what size your genome is, you'll, you'll want to do more, fewer or less reads. So if you've got Leishmania, probably 50 million reads is enough. 100 million reads is probably too many. Um, once you've got your reads, you need to align them against your reference because assembling uh, Illumina reads de novo does not work all that well. I mean, you can do it and it'll get probably 85 or 90 percent of your genome pretty accurate, but the last part won't work. Uh, and if you have a reference, it's much easier. So you do your, uh, you use your favorite tool. I like bow tie. I was, uh, I think we saw yesterday, uh, you used uh, BWA. There are other tools available that you can use as well. And they're all pretty much the same. They have their own nuances. What you can easily find is differences in, in ploidy or SOMI. Uh, you can look for comp copy number variation and single nucleotide polymorphisms. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. If you want to use, um, to do reference guided assembly, there's uh, some programs that will do that. I, this isn't really all that popular anymore, I think. Um, now, there is a problem, though. If your sequence is, and I think, Greg, you talked about this um, you were asked about this, maybe it was Greg or maybe it was Paul yesterday, about well, what happens if you're, how do you find a gene that's, that's novel in your organism um, that's not in the reference? Well, one way to do that is to assemble all of the reads that didn't align to your genome. So I would always advocate doing that. Um, most of the things that don't align don't align because the sequence is not very good. So they're probably not going to assemble very well as well. Uh, but that will, if you take all of the things that don't assemble, uh, and don't align, sorry, and then assemble them, you will find, if there's a, a missing sequence that's unique to your organism, you will find it. The other thing that it's really good for finding is contamination from another organism. And that, as we'll see in a moment, uh, very briefly, is important. Um, because you, you don't want to... Uh, you want, you want to be careful that if you find something that's, you know, uh, in your unaligned reads, you want to make sure that it wasn't because you had E. coli contamination or some other contamination in there. Um, the other thing that, that you'll want to do is you can use this to, to fill gaps as well that uh, might exist in your reference genome. Okay, so that's sort of a brief introduction. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's pretty much what most of you will do now if you do genome sequencing. Now, I would suggest that probably you don't want to do all that much genome sequencing because it requires, it, it looks very easy when you put it up there, but in practice it's not trivial. You need to actually know how to, to um, program in, in 
Linux to, to do that, and you need to know Python and all sorts of things. So it's probably not for the, the faint of heart, but some people do do it. Um, where do you find the data um, for what someone else or you, you may have sequenced? So for us, the first place that we would go, sorry, is go to TriTripDB. And, and this is a show of hands. Who's been to TriTripDB here? Who has actually gone to TriTripDB to look up something? Put your hand up. Come on, I need to know. Oh my goodness. That's fewer than I had hoped. Well, you'll get a chance this afternoon. All right. Um, I can't believe that anyone who's working on trypanosomatids hasn't been to TriTripDB because there's so much information there that is critical. And so hopefully after this afternoon, you will be confident to go to TriTripD and find out information. You won't learn, there's a lot of information there, it's growing all the time, so you need to practice. All right. The Sanger maintained a database that actually predates TriTripDB called GDB, and they still maintain that to some extent. I wouldn't suggest that you go there anymore. This is the South American one that uh, I'm not even sure that it's still actually live. It was a couple of years ago, so I probably wouldn't go there. You can go to GenBank or one of the European, the European version of GenBank, um, you know, EMBL, or you can go to the Japanese one. I will warn you that GenBank is very redundant and often is confusing and is, and is not very well organized. So uh, you have to be very careful about GenBank, but there are things that are in GenBank that are not in TriTripDB. So it is often a good place to go, but be careful about going to GenBank. Um, there used to be a very useful, um, a very useful site called TDR Targets, which I'm pretty sure is not available in, any, uh, any longer. But this, used, this was an effort that was funded by WHO for a while to really take the, the three genomes and rank them and allow people to rank them. You could go in and rank uh, them in order of what you think thought was your criterion for, for making drug targets. So it was very useful and I used to do a, uh, a practical on, on that um, up until I think the last time was the first time I didn't do that where I replaced it with the RNA-seq stuff. But maybe that's still active. I haven't even tried to use it uh, recently. Okay, so what's available? Last year when I made this slide, this was the end of last year, there were, at my count, this was probably in November of 2017, 71 genomes available from trypanosomatids or euglenoids. Uh, and if you look with very... If you've got very sharp eyes, you can see that this is Euglena gracilis here, and this is Diplonema, so there were two, uh, two Euglenoids up there, and the rest are all canidoplasts. Uh, and so um, you'll see that there, some of them were in GenBank, there were 29 in GenBank, and 35 in TriTripDB. Uh, most of them were sequence only, especially those that were in GenBank. They only had the sequence, they were completely unannotated. And that's probably still correct. So even though GenBank at this stage had 62 trypanosomatid genomes, uh, fewer than half of them were actually annotated. Um, so that wasn't going to be very good in terms of finding a gene in that particular organism, uh, unless you wanted to do all of the uh, annotation that I told you about. Uh, TriTripDB, on the other hand, has a, most of the genomes in TriTripDB are annotated. Uh, now. TriTripDB in the latest version actually has more genomes. So the latest version, there are 46 Leishmania um, or trypanosomatid genomes and actually Crithidia and a couple of other odd Leishmania related ones. So here's, here's sort of a, uh, a list of all of the Leish things that are, I think, closely related. At least Leishmania are closely related to Leishmania. Uh, and so you can see that most of them have been annotated and they have between 8,000 and 9,000 genes, predicted genes. Um, you'll notice that some of them have a more. This one, this Leptomonas, has 10,000 genes. I would be a little bit suspicious that about 2,000 of those genes are actually not protein coding, so be careful. Um, you'll notice that the numbers vary all over the place. I would not believe that these were accurate to more than 5 or 10%. 
Uh, some uh, organisms have a lot of uh, resequencing, so many different uh, strains of the same organism have now been sequenced, so you can find SNPs and that type of stuff. Very little uh, information about, uh, about chips. Um, uh, I've got stuff that I should probably actually submit at some stage, but I haven't. There's some that have um, ESTs, which is a, a special type of transcriptomics that was done back in the two, 2000s. Now no one does that anymore. There were some microarrays, no one does them anymore. Uh, and now they're becoming more and more RNA-seq data sets available, and even some proteomics data sets as well. So, so you can probably find your favorite organism here. Uh, and in fact, you might even be able to find your favorite um, strain of your particular species of Leishmania that you're interested in. So that would be a great resource that, for everyone in the room. But what can we learn from, from this, and what can we learn from actually doing next generation from sequencing of a new strain? Because you know, we heard yesterday of, of uh, how, how you can learn stuff from this. And, and you know, again, just to reiterate what we heard from yesterday, you can look for so many changes, you can look for gene copy number variation, and you can look for polymorphisms in the sequence. Uh, and you can look also for differences in gene content. And I'll just sort of briefly go over how you might do that. Um, and I won't tell you precisely how you do it, um, because I'm only going to show you the end result of a lot of computational uh, processing that you then have to summarize. So here is a, um, a comparison of, I think, probably 10 strains of Leishmania shigasi from South America that we sequenced and we compared to the L. infantum reference genome. Uh, and we looked at the coverage, the, the fold coverage, or the median normalized fold coverage for each of the chromosomes. And what you can immediately uh, see is rather similar to that heat plot that we saw yesterday, uh, just a different representation, that chromosome 31 is tetraploid almost all of the time. Sometimes, in this particular strain, it's actually got five copies. Um, and then in some of the other chromosomes, you'll see that sometimes they have three copies. Um, some chromosomes generally only have two copies. Uh, and this particular set of strains, these were all clinical isolates, so there's actually not very much uh, um, ploidy changes or somi changes going on here. Now, I have a question for the audience, though. How can you have something that has two and a half copies of a chromosome? And let's ask, see if there's anyone who's not a genomics person. All right. Who wants to, who wants to guess? No? You want to have a, have a shot? No? All right, come on, tell me. I think that it's about the mosaicism that we can find in the Shemani, meaning uh, uh, it's, uh, we are looking now at uh, a population of Shemani, so we are finding some uh, cell with, uh, cells with uh, three copies of the chromosome, some cells with uh, maybe one single copy of the chromosome. Exactly, exactly right. So it's, it's this, it's because we're sequencing an entire population here, some of the cells, and in this case, if you have on average for the entire population, you have on average two and a half copies of the chromosome, that probably tells you that about half of the cells had three copies of that chromosome and half of them had two copies. Yes? But does this, um, is in relation with the stage of the Ah, good point, good point. So generally, well, not generally, you always sequence only one stage of the parasite. So, so this tells you what the genome looked like in that stage of the parasite, which is usually promastigotes, the life mania. Now, as far as I know, it's generally, there's not very many changes between stages. Now, that's not quite true if you grow amastigotes and then grow them as promastigotes, over time you'll get a lot of selection for parasites that have, um, that have uh, amplified bits of chromosomes or entire chromosomes. So you do have to be careful. So the, the, this is really dependent on exactly what the sample is that you're preparing. So it is, it is you have, that was, I think I asked a question yesterday, is that it's a little bit, um, risky to compare something that came out of a very small number of passages out of an animal here with something that's been in culture for a very long time. 
And in fact, we'll see, I think, later on, uh, El Terrenzali that I've sequenced that's been in culture for you know, years, and it has a lot more um, uh, so many differences. These are relatively close to the, um, to the um, amastigotes that came out of the, um, out of the people. Uh, so there, there doesn't seem to be as much. And in fact, I think that's sort of the story that's emerging, is that when you, when you sequence stuff directly or as close as possible to the animal, there's less, uh, less uh, poison changes. Not none, but, but less. So you have to be careful about interpreting that. All right. Next is, well, okay, so copy number variation. And I, Copy number variation can arise in two ways. It can arise from amplification of tandem repeats within the genome, so that's within the chromosome, or it can arise from amplification of a, of a region of a genome as an episomal element. And it's up to you to figure out from the data which one it is. So here's an example of where I'm comparing uh, two strains of, of parasite, or two strains of, uh, I can't even remember what Leishmania, uh, this must be Leishmania donovani. Um, I think, in fact, this is, this is Greg's data from comparing the uh, um, uh, strains, uh, a strain of, of L. donovani from Sri Lanka that causes visceral disease to a strain that causes a cutaneous disease. And, and frankly, I can't remember which one, whether this was the visceral or the cutaneous, that has more higher coverage in this region of chromosome 23. But suffice it to say that there's two, two replicates of each one, so you can see that, that it's, it's very um, stable. This region here on chromosome 23, there are many more copies of that, there are probably twice as many or three times as many copies of that DNA in this strain than there are in the other strain compared to the reference. And so this, in this particular strain, the, there seems to have been an amplification of this region. Now, it turns out that that region had been seen to be frequently amplified before, back in you know, the 1980s. Steve Beverly's group and Mark Willett's group had, had found that this was actually called the H region, and it was involved in uh, tobinophen resistance uh, in, in other strains of Leishmania. And so this region frequently amplifies as a circular episode. Um, so if you, if you see an amplification and you can go back in the literature and find that this has been found as an episode, that's probably going to tell you that it's an episode. Um, whereas here, on a different chromosome, this is chromosome 16, same set, you can see that there's amplification of this region here. Well, when I looked at the genome, this is a region where there are tandem repeats of a hypothetical protein. So what's happened in this strain is that there are probably two or three times as many tandem repeats of that um, sequence, uh, of that, that gene, that, as there are in this one and in the reference. Now, a dirty little secret is, how good is the assembly of your reference? And a lot of the reference genomes, uh, particularly... Um, some of the, the ones that were done in sort of the late 2000s, early 2010s, were done by assembling uh, Illumina reads, which is not very good at assembling uh, tandem repeats. And so you have these tandem repeat collapses, so you would often find that there's much higher coverage in all of the genomes that you sequence in regions where there are tandem repeats. And we'll see that come up again in a moment. So you have to be very careful that, to uh, not assume that the reference actually only has one copy or two copies of your gene. That may be incorrect. You actually have to uh, look to see what the coverage is. How can you find sequence polymorphisms? So there are several different types of, of uh, things that you have to look for, and this is where you really... Um, there, there are programs that will call sequence polymorphisms and they're reasonably accurate, but I want to go down to the sort of nitty-gritty level to tell you what the difficulties are that, that you have to deal with when you're looking at that. So, so this is, and you probably can't read the individual letters, but I think you can see that each of these little boxes here is a different base pair aligned to the reference. And so if it's gray or blue, that means it matches the reference. The difference between the colors is whether it's on the bottom strand or the top strand. Where it's red, that means that there's a sequence of that position that's different from the reference. Well, you can see here, on this read here, there are three bases that are different from the reference. 
But they are probably different, not because there's a real difference, but probably because there was a sequence error in that particular sequence. So if you find, you know, here, 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 just a, a, a single read has a difference there, that's probably irrelevant. It's just a sequencing error, so, error, so you can ignore that. Doesn't mean that it was, you should ignore it. It's possible that it's real, but it's less likely to be real. What you will get more excited about is where you see, whoops, sorry, where you see multiple differences here, and in fact, probably this is better here. So here, you can see that all of the sequences in this particular alignment are different from the reference. So that means that the genome that you've sequenced has a probably a homozygous SNP difference from the reference. Now, another problem that you should be aware of is that all of the reference genomes are presented as a single sequence. So they've probably decided arbitrarily, the computer has decided, if there was a heterozygous SNP, if there were two sequences in that position, it picks one of them at random. And so you don't actually know whether the reference had a heterozygous SNP at this position or whether it was homozygous and you've got a complete difference. What you can tell, though, you'd have to sequence the resequence the reference. And sometimes that data is available, but actually in the databases, in the reference sequence, it's not. Um, so you have to be careful about that. This one, I'm oh, sorry, I should back up. This one is a special situation here. You can see that only some of the sequences are different from the reference. So there may be, um, there may be you know, here they match the reference, here they're different. What you'll also notice in that region is that the coverage is much higher here. So what we've got here going on is probably a repeat collapse. So we don't know whether these are differences between the reference genome and the genome that you're sequencing, or whether it's just differences between the uh, different number of copies of the gene. Uh, and really, you, it's difficult to tell, looking at this, what's going on here. You'd have to look at that in more detail. Uh, when you look at that in sort of, you know, over on a grander scale, you can see that you can, uh, here I'm comparing some um, El Shigasi to the El Infantum reference, and you can see that the Brazilian Shigasis have just a few SNPs over a region of, well, let's say, 20 kilobases. There's just a few differences from the reference. Whereas El Donovani from, from Asia, there are more differences, and El Donovani from Sudan, there are even more differences. What you'll notice is that the Eldonavani from Sudan is not very similar to the Eldonavani from, from Asia, and in fact, it's probably about equally distant from the El Infantum and El Shigasi. Um, I've shown you El Major here, and if you looked at this, you'd think, oh, well, why is El Major so similar in this region here? Okay, well, you would be fooling yourself because, in fact, it's not similar there. The problem is that El Major is so different that it didn't actually align in that region. So there were no SNPs there because none of the, none of the reads aligned. So you have to be careful going across um, species like that. Here's another example of, of sort of a, a real experiment. And this was a an ex, uh, study that we did with Greg that I've already alluded to, um, where we compared the visceral, which is now in um, is in red versus eucutaneous. And you can see that the visceral strain had more copies of the gene, uh, of genes in this region of the genome than does this, the cutaneous um, strain. And what I'm doing here is I'm measuring the, the copy number or the read depth. And it turns out that this region is the A2 locus. Um, when I compared this to the reference, and when we did this experiment, there wasn't a reference from El Donovani. We had to use the El Infantum reference. This region was completely messed up. It was completely unassembled. In fact, it ended right about here. Uh, and so it was only because I sort of saw something going on here and I knew that this was a problem in the A2 region that I went in and I hand-assembled hand the A2 locus and then redid the alignment against my... Um, manually assembled uh, sequence, and then it became obvious that the VL strain had more copies of the A2 gene in this locus, and more copies of the A2 rel gene um, as well. And so this is a very complicated um, 
uh, repeat within repeat locus that I don't think I have another slide on. Uh, but if you go back and read the original paper, you can, you can see that in more detail. Uh, Greg then took over and really showed that that was in fact the case, that the, that the visceral strains have more, more uh, copies of more B A2 genes. They have in fact one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six copies of the A2 gene. The difference, and this is looking at the protein now rather than the, uh, the DNA. The difference in the size is the difference in the number of repeats within each of those copies of the gene. So A2 is a, there are six or seven copies in the genome and each copy has a different number of internal tandem repeats. And it turns out that, that the visceral strain had more copies of the gene and more copies or different copies, different repeats in each gene. So the CL had only three genes, whereas the visceral, I think, um, Greg, you said seven now, is that right? Yeah. And that's, that's of, the, of the haploid genome. Yeah, that's right. And the CL, it shows three bands here, but that top band is, there's actually two genes in there. Yes. So the right, so you can see this is a more intense band on the, on the western, so there are probably actually two copies of this and, and one of each of these. So, so that's another thing that's that complicated, is, is that here the two alleles were probably different as well. And, and A2, there is two separate loci that are actually uh, in inverted repeats. So this is a complicated locus to, to figure out. Um, and I, I probably shouldn't s steal Greg's thunder, but I don't think you... Are you, were you going to talk about this, Greg? Uh, no? So basically, uh, he, if you knocked out the A2 gene from, from the visceral strain, uh, it became less virulent. And if you added the A2 gene back to the cutaneous strain, it became more virulent in the, in the mouse model. So uh, this is all published. But I think that was sort of the, the reason I put that in there was that, is that it was the original sequence alignment that gave us the clue on that. Um, and it harked back to actually something that Greg and I had seen back in the original genome, in that the L major is missing that entire locus. Well, actually, it has a many fewer repeats of the of the A2 gene. So lessons learned from all, of, at least my lessons learned from all this, is be careful of sample contamination. We had one strain from Brazil where we sequenced it, and about two thirds of the reads did not align to the Leishmania genome. I blasted them, and they were Burkholderia. So it was bacterial contamination of the sample. Uh, there are lots of changes in some employee. As far as I can tell, uh, you know, everyone else has seen this, there have been several papers published on this, and so far it's been very difficult to make very much sense of what those changes in ploidy mean, because they are transient and they probably have more to do with culture conditions than anything else. There are lots of smaller copy number variations, which again are difficult to correlate with phenotype, and there are lots, tens of thousands of SNPs, both homozygous and heterozygous SNPs, that you see between strains. So it's actually been, I think, very difficult to associate the presence or absence of a SNP with a phenotype. And, and I know Greg has had some experience on this. And it's not to say it's impossible, but you'll have a lot of false leads. Uh, and so that's sort of my final, my final uh, take home message is here. We thought that by just sequencing a bunch of strains that it would be obvious what the correlation between the genome and the pathogenesis was, and it's turned out to be less obvious. So good luck. And good luck to anyone else who wants to do it. It's not that you shouldn't do it, it's just not going to be as simple as you might think. Okay, uh, I want to spend the rest of this um, talk about, uh, talking about a new, uh, relatively new, it's not all that new now, PAC biosequencing, which gets around a lot of the disadvantages of the Illumina reads in that you get long reads and so you can fully assemble your genome and you can also look for DNA modifications. And I'm probably going a little slowly so I probably have to speed up a little bit. The disadvantage is it costs you about 6K to sequence your genome by um, PAC bio. Um, I won't bother telling you how it works um, because it's not really all that important. Um, but essentially what you do is you make long insert libraries and then you put them into the machine and you get reads that vary anywhere from three kilobases to you know, 20 kilobases uh, and you filter and trim them and you assemble them into contigs using your favorite assembler and there are several different types around there and then 
you have to order the context uh, and fill the sequence gaps, and then you have to correct the errors, and then you have to annotate it, and you have to curate it. So here's a real life example uh, for El Torrentoli and El Donavani. We sequenced it. We ran um, you know, 12 or 14 different uh, chips on this, and we generated 2 million reads. Average read length was 3.5 uh, kilobases. Um, so here, as you can see, that we've got most of the reads around 3 kbs, but some of them are as big as 20 kb. We assembled them together. This is El Donavani. Uh, and you can see that when we assembled them together, whoops, sorry, we ended up with only 143 contigs. And the average size of a contig was 700 kilobases. Right? So if you do this on an Illumina sequence, the average size of your contig is probably half a kilobase. Uh, there will be bigger ones. The biggest contig that we had here was 2.7 megabases, and that was the entire chromosome 20, 36. It entire, assembled the entire chromosome into one piece, uh, just straight out of the box. And, and so you can see, here's a plot of the coverage depth versus the length of the uh, chromosome. And you can see that most of the, most of the contigs have pretty low coverage. There is something out here that had a very high coverage. Anyone want to guess what that might be? This is a repeat. Could be a repeat, or it could be a mini circle, or um, yeah. So that's another uh, another type of repeat. I think this actually turned out to be telomeric repeats because they all assemble together. Um, there's more contigs, as I said, 130 odd contigs. You have to actually um, align them so that you can assemble them into chromosomes. That's done, at least for me, semi-manually. There are sort of automated methods that sort of work at the moment. Uh, and so it's not, doesn't, it's not too difficult to assemble you know, 200 contigs into, into uh, 36 chromosomes. And some chromosomes only have one contig, others have uh, multiple contigs. Um, and then what we did is we actually remapped them against that to improve the, um, the um, alignment. We sequenced a number of genomes, uh, and I won't belabor the point here, but you can see that, uh, you know, here's a, actually a, a, a comparison of, of El Torrentoli. When it was originally sequenced by 454 and Illumina sequencing, there were 4,500 gaps in the, in the um, uh, genome because they were four and a half thousand contigs. When we sequenced it, we had basically 38 gaps. So really a pretty big improvement, um, uh, many fewer ends. Um, and you can see that we found many um, more genes as well, and more complete genes. And that's pretty much holes for all of them. Uh, however, there are, there are some problems with smart sequencing, pack bio sequencing, is that it's error prone. And it's particularly, um, although I think it's gotten better more recently, the assemblers like to put frame shifts in there. So you have to be careful about uh, frame shifts. And in fact, we use, we always correct our, um, our PacBio assemblies with Illumina reads to try to correct for frame shifts. Um, but I think the, the assemblers have gotten better since I made this slide, so it's perhaps not quite so much of a problem. Um, so here's an example of, for El Torrentoli, of our original assembly. And let's pick, let's say, let's pick chromosome 10. So in the original assembly, we had 49 contigs that mapped to chromosome 10. Of those, um, I only used 23 of them to align. And in fact, when I aligned them all, most of them were actually looking at a, an allelic variation. So there were actually only four contigs. There were only four gaps in that chromosome when we when we aligned them. Um, and then uh, after it was quivered and gap filling, we still had four, but several of the other chromosomes here, we had a gap, and chromosome two that we filled by TB jelly. And so we ended up with most chromosomes actually have no gaps in them. Chromosome 12 was particularly bad. When you say a gap, how big is the gap? I mean, in terms of uh, nucleotides or? Well, that's hard to know because you don't have a good reference. Usually probably in the, in the uh, hundred to, hundreds of uh, base pairs to okay. kilobases, but yeah, probably pretty small usually. Okay. Most of the gaps are actually not real gaps, they're assembly gaps because they occur where you, the assembler can't actually assemble 
the um, repeated genes together, even in packed bio. If you have if you have your repeats up in total more than you know ten kilobases, you won't be able to assemble them. Donovani, I won't belabor these. Oh, we did it on Crithidia, um, and what we found in Crithidia is that we were able to map a lot of retrotransposable elements. So it was known in Crithidia, as in, in T. brucei and T. cruzi, that there were a lot of retrotransposable elements, but no one could really map them very well. With PacBio, your sequence was good enough that we got intact, um, uh, intact retrotransposons, or uh, elements, some of them were not actually intact in terms of being functional, most of them were not. Uh, and they fell into uh, several different sequence classes. So there were about 140 um, retrotransposable elements in the, in the um, Crithidia genome. And they were found, interestingly enough, in several different loci. So most of them occurred at most telomeres. There was usually a, a um, sub-telomeric tate, which is telomere-associated transposable elements, so you might expect to find them at telomeres. But we also found, um, found them at synteny breaks. So here's a, um, a Cree element at a synteny break. We found them at um, strand switch regions. And, and so these, I call these chromosome sires or chromosome internal retrotransposable elements to distinguish them from tates. And we also found tates at, uh, at repeat expansion loci. And so here's a, a series of folate biopterin transporter repeats, and right in the middle of them there's a, a transposable element. So which sort of suggests that maybe the retrotransposable element played a role in that repeat expansion. Um, I won't bother talking about this very much. Uh, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the ability of packed biosequencing to detect modified nucleotides. So there's a modified nucleotide that's trypanosomatid specific called base J, and with, with packed biosequencing, you can use the interperiod interpulse uh, duration to identify which nucleotides have J. Uh, and this is published, so I won't uh, belabor that, but the J's occur as pairs that are separated by 12 nucleotides, which gave us some insights into the mechanism. I will say that J's in Leishmania are found at transcription termination sites, so at, um, at convergent strand switch regions, all have J, and that's where uh, transcription terminates. So in, at least in Leishmania, J has a role in transcription termination. Uh, the last part of this talk is about chromatin confirmation capture. So as you know, DNA doesn't um, appear as random, it's packaged up into chromatin, uh, and there's a, a technique called chromatin confirmation capture, where basically you cross-link the chromatin together, and so DNA that's together in three-dimensional space is more likely to be linked together. I won't go into the details of how this works, but essentially, if you believe me, you, you end up cross-linking uh, pieces of DNA together that are close together in three-dimensional space, and then you sequence both ends, and one end will be from one part of the genome, and the other end will be from another part of the genome, and because they were on the same molecule, you now know that those two pieces of DNA were close together in three-dimensional space in the original cell. And you can do that in high throughput now using um, uh, Illumina sequencing, and that's why it's called high c um, And essentially what you get, if you count the number of, of times that each position in the genome has a read that has a link to a different uh, area of the genome. You count, okay, here we've got position one. 20 times it's linked to something very close to it. 10 times it's linked to something that's um, further away. And then two times it's linked to, to something that's even further away. And so you end up with a matrix where on each dimension you have uh, the 36 million or 32 million positions in the genome. And then there are corresponding a number of rows where you have how many uh, reads had both of those things on this, how many reads had both of those um, positions. And you end up with something that looks like this, where the intensity tells you is a reflection of the number of times that you saw reads that are like that. Uh, and you have to normalize it, 
And so obviously, as you go across the genome, things that are close together on the, engine, on, uh, the genomic sequence will be much more likely to be linked together than things that are further apart. So what you're looking for are places where you have a, a link between something at one position with a, a position farther away. And in fact, when you look at you know, a reasonable portion of the genome, you see something like that, that looks like this. And so you can find here an example of something where this sequence at this position on this axis, that position, that sequence seems to be similar, it seems to be linked with everything else in the genome. And what we assume that to be is an episome, because that episomal plasma is now floating around and it can interact with everything. It turns out there were multiple copies of it as well. Um, Here's something where the beginning of chromosome 35 interacted with a lot of chromosome 34. What that was, was that there was a, there was a sequence at the beginning of chromosome 35 that also actually occurred on chromosome 35, sorry, 34, but in our original assembly was missing. So that told us that our original assembly was inaccurate. Here we can see that there's a region on chromosome 36 that interacts with a region on chromosome 35, but it also interacts with a region on chromosome 34 and 33, back going up this way as well. So this region here is um, a centromere because every there's one region on each chromosome that interacts with one other region on every other chromosome, and that's because the centromeres will be together in three-dimensional space, at least for during... Um, um, uh, chromosome um, um, duplication, replication. And then finally, you can look for little regions here where you're, you've probably got chromosome looping. So here's a region here that links this sequence here with this sequence down here. So there's probably a loop in the chromosome. Um, and so we're in the process of, of looking at that. Uh, I'll just talk about the centromeres. This is another way of looking at that. We, filtered the data out, and so where there's intense spots here, that means that, that you've got an interaction between chromosomes. And so what we were able to do was to map the centromere on every chromosome. And it turns out that right around that same time, Patrick Bastian's group used a different method to map um, the chromosomes, the centromeres in L major. Ours was in L parentally, I think. And they turned out to be in exactly the same spots. And then we could be confident that these were, in fact, the, the uh, centromeres. Oh, and I was going to say that that all of the whoops, sorry that all of the centromeres are AT rich. Uh, they all contain base J, so they're at transcriptional boundaries. Uh, the other thing that high C can be used for is to improve your assembly. Let's say you have particularly a, 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 a short read assembly, just a luminar assembly. You're going to end up here's an example where you have a, a short read assembly, and your average um, Chromosome, the average contact length is only 30 kilobases. If you throw high C on top of that, what high C do, does was it will use the, the linkage between these contigs to say which contigs belong together. And so you can now come up with, um, improve the, um, the assembly so that your average contact length is now about 180 kilobases. There will still be gaps between those contigs. You'll now have gaps in the contigs. Um, but it will give you a much better uh, assembly. And in fact, it's almost as good as doing it on pack bio um, uh, assembly. So, so using high C can help you uh, improve just uh, uh, an Illumina uh, assembly. Last slide for this section is this was all done, as we said, on populations of cells. The field is now moving to single cell sequencing. So you can sequence the genome of single cells um, by amplifying, by isolating single cells and, and amplifying the DNA. And so you can, uh, that, I think this is not used all that much, um, very much to look at variation in, in single cells, particularly in, in our organisms. There's probably not going to be all that much variation, not that anyone's actually looked. But where it's becoming very popular is doing RNA sequencing on single cells. And what people have found is that there's enormous variation between different cell types, and even between what you might think were the same cell type. The RNA expression will be quite different. And, and this is, whoops, sorry, this is an example of what's called a Tiesney plot, uh, 
Uh, and this, uh, which is sort of a type of principal component analysis, this plot is, is used to distinguish between uh, you know, a group of cells over here, single cells, each, of the, each dot here is a single cell, that all fall in this space. So these are probably much more likely to be related to one another and function than they are to these guys over here. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but this is something that really is starting to becoming uh, very well, highly used, particularly in, in um, cancer and uh, immunology. 